Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 3, and then skip down and look at verse 15. Let's stand together if you're able to do so for a moment out of respect for God's Word. Genesis chapter 2, and let's begin in verse number 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended, notice this, his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in, that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. And so you see that refrain of work, work, work. And then if you will, go down to verse 15. And the Lord God took the man that he created back in verse 7, and play, uh, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, notice, to dress it and to keep it. So we're starting a new series today looking at work ethics, the ethics of work. Um, just, I don't know if you've read lately studies of how much of our lives we sleep. Have you read any of those studies, how much percentage-wise we sleep of our lives? I would also submit to you that a large chunk of your life is working. And so sleeping to build up strength, to be able to work, and you work, I mean, that's the, that's the largest chunk of our lives. And there are things in work that I think are gifts from God that we tend to walk right by. And we want to look at over the next few weeks here together, the ethics of work, whatever that looks like for you at your stage of life and responsibility, but beginning today by looking at work as dignity. There is dignity, dignity to our labor for the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the joy it is to be here today. Each person that's here, the unique story and narrative, Lord, that has led them to be here today, we thank you for your uh, entrance into our lives, that you work and move in a real and powerful way, that you use the circumstances And Lord, even the challenges of our lives to cause us to hear from you and to follow you. And I pray that that would continue today in each of our lives. Or if there's one here who does not know you as personal Savior, pray that you would draw them to yourself today in need and then to turn to Christ alone. For believers today who know you as Savior, Lord, may you restore their appreciation for the work, the responsibilities that they shoulder. And that, Lord, you would give them a fresh sense of vision and purpose in the place of vocation you've called them to. Thank you for giving us the privilege to work before you. May uh, today's time give us a greater sense of that. Well, thank you and praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. If any of you tracked in the news that straws or plastic straws specifically are falling on hard times, um, I won't get into my take on that. I think you could guess uh, maybe my perspective on that. Uh, This past Friday, we lived wild, and I drank a soft beverage with a plastic straw on Friday evening and just lived on the edge, as we all do. And uh, the other day, I came across this story uh, in a book that is written by James Dobson uh, entitled Stories of Heart and Home. And uh, that, that thought in our culture brought this story to mind I'd like to read to you kind of as we begin. Uh, Dobson says this, it does appear at times like life is intentionally designed to strip us of dignity and to make us look simply ridiculous. My friend Mike would certainly agree. When he was a university student, he had one of those unexpected little experiences that makes a person feel completely stupid. He was on campus at lunchtime one day and decided to eat in an outdoor fast food restaurant. Mike, my friend, ordered a hamburger, some french fries, and a chocolate shake. He walked away carrying his food, in addition to his briefcase, some computer reports, and a couple of books. Unfortunately, every table was in use, and so he had no place to set down all of this stuff. Mike stood there watching the other students who were eating and talking at their tables. While he waited for someone to leave, the smell of the food got uh, the best of him. He bent down to take a sip of the shake he was carrying, but instead of getting the straw into his mouth, he jammed it into his nose. The natural reaction would be to pull the shake down and to move the head up. This is exactly what Mike, my friend, did, which proved to be a major mistake. The straw remained stuck in his nose and came out of the shake, and he had not a hand available to remove it. (laughs) There he stood in front of hundreds of his peers with the straw sticking out of his nose and chocolate shake dripping down the front of his pants. I don't know if you've ever had one of those moments where you just feel like a complete fool or imbecile, but sometimes the setting of that is not in our leisure, it is also in our labor. And what I want us to think about today is the dignity of work that has been stripped 
uh, in our culture in a way that God has not intended and that we would allow him to restore an appreciation of labor as viewed through the lens of Scripture. See, many of us in the room are embarrassed not just about how we eat, uh, even straws included. We also feel insignificant or marginalized by what we do for a living. And whatever you do in the home or out of the home, I pray that through our study today, God will restore your appreciation for the place that he has put us. An author I was reading said this, Everyone will be forgotten. Nothing we will do will make a difference. And all of our good endeavors, even the best, will come to naught. Unless there is God. Uh, if, we, uh, if the God of the Bible exists and there is a true reality beneath and behind this God that we claim to worship, then this life is not the only life. And therefore, every good endeavor, even the simplest ones, pursued in response to God's calling can matter forever. And so the works that you do and the works that I do uh, do impact eternity and with it comes a sense of dignity. The question is, no matter what we do for a living or for our family, how do we allow God to infuse it with sacred dignity where others tend to or we tend to be a bit dismissive? Let's study today here in Genesis chapter 2. We'll go back to chapter 1 as well. Let's talk about two dignifying truths that God gives us about work that I hope will infuse you with a fresh sense of it in the place he's put you. Number one, first of all, let's talk for a few minutes about a dignified origin. Work possesses a dignified origin. Now, when we read Genesis chapter 2, this is prior to the flood or prior to the fall. Does it not jolt you just a bit to read that God is working and that God has given to man a place of work or labor? In the garden, work was a blessing. It was not a part of the curse. It was not the result of brokenness. It was a place of blessing. It was a place that God purposely put man. And this week we'll talk about it in our small groups, but work is a basic human need. It's as basic as our need for food, our, our need for beauty, our need for rest, our need for friendship, and the list goes on. Uh, it, it, it is it is it's something that we desperately crave and need, and God fills our life uh, as we see here in the text. All right, let's talk about a few ways we see work is dignified as we consider its origins. Look, if you will, in chapter 2 here in verse number 1, you notice it says, Thus the earth was finished, and all the host of them, and on the seventh day God ended his work. Number one, first of all, let's allow work to give to us an assi- a, a pattern origin, a patterned origin, letting work as given by God to give us a pattern of where we came from and where we're headed. The other day someone shared this with me. They said, men talking to the husbands, he said this, men, have you ever uh, forgotten a significant uh, occasion that your wife expected you to remember? I asked that question. Then they said this, the way to turn your ordinary sofa into a sleeper sofa is to simply forget your wife's birthday. Uh, You'll find out how comfortable or not comfortable that sofa is. I think sometimes when it comes to work, we forget the origins of work. And because of that, we lack the rhythm that God intended for us at not just the dawn of creation, but today in the life and place that we live, God has given to us this pattern. All right, let me give you two things, not on the slides today, but they're on your handout and your bulletin, your outline. I encourage you to jot down these couple of thoughts. Number one, our work needs to be patterned uh, after God, needs to be patterned after God. And we see that in verses 1 through 3, this pattern of work that is after God. Our labor is after God. And we see in verses 1 and 2 that the Bible begins with work. The Bible talks about the Garden of Eden, a lot of things that were enjoyed there, but one of the things that was enjoyed there was work. Uh, And we see God working, and we see Him inviting man into that same work. And so the author of this book of Genesis describes God's creation as work, a work that we too now steward as those who represent Him. And then you notice in verses 2 and following, it says he rested on the seventh day from all of his work. Again, in verse 3, he rested from all of his work. And so we see this pattern of work and rest, work and rest. And I think all of us struggle to not lean one direction. Either work is a bad thing, work is something to avoid, or for some of us, if you're wired like me, we overdo it in the work category. And I don't say that in a proud way, I say that to my shame, that many times work displaces relationship and and, and rest and renewal and things that I need in my life 
uh, that we all need in our lives, and we lean one way or the other. Uh, Work is also not something to run from. It's also not something that's the end all, that I only rest to then be able to work better. Uh, They both have their part as we follow the pattern that God has given. Now, with that being said, what is the ratio of God's work as the model to rest? It is what? Six to one. Six to one. Adam, when he walked with God in the cool of the evening, how many of those days that he walked with God at the end of the day, how many of those days were work days? And how many of those days were rest days? Six out of every seven days that Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening, that day that he just finished up was a work day. And I think sometimes we forget that. We forget the pattern with God. And some of you, to be very direct with you today, the reason your relationship with God is suffering, there's not enough work in it. There's not enough labor in it. Not not sweating and groaning and just that kind of work, but asserting yourself and the initiative and the effort to work out for God the salvation he has entrusted to you. And so we need to pattern our lives after a God who works. Paradise is usually found, uh, is not usually found in more leisure, is often found in a fresh vision of your job and responsibilities, the ones God gave to you. Some of you today, if you're not careful, if you're like me, the temptation is, if I could just have more free time, if I could just work less, me and God would be better off. My, my physical well-being, my mental and emotional well-being, be careful to not see God and your best as the opposite of the work God has given you. And I would give you just an example of that in, in real time and space. Have you ever visited a loved, loved one in a nursing home, an assisted care place, or, where all of their responsibilities have been stripped from them? Their complaint or their concern in those, that season of life rarely has to do with physical pain. It rarely has to do with other things they're facing. They just want to matter. They want to be a contributor. They want to do something. Don't buy the lie today. You need less to do. Uh, Maybe it's a fresh vision of the work God established with his own example and that he has entrusted uh, to your care. To be fully human means we work. To be everything God created us to be and that that he himself is requires us to labor uh, for the Lord. All right. Secondly, go back to chapter one for just a moment and notice the last verse that, that prefaces the beginning of chapter two, verse 31. And we see a second aspect of this work. So it's patterned after God and after his work. That's our model. Number two, look at verse 31 back in chapter uh, one. And God saw everything that he had made as he worked out uh, his creative purposes and intentions. And behold, notice this phrase, it was very good in the mor- evening and the morning were the sixth day. Number two, jot this down. Not only should our work be patterned after God. Number two, patterned after delight. Pattern after delight. Notice that God not only works, but he takes delight in what he has done. He takes delight in what he has done. In the beginning, God worked, and this work was was something that he did, something that he accomplished, and he took joy in that labor, and he invites us into that same delight. Um, Think about the last job well done that's a part of your life, the thing that you'd say, you know what, that's something I did well. Not in a proud way, but in a, uh, in a delightful way. You just take pleasure. I built that, or I, I designed that, or I planned that, or whatever the case may be, or that person or that relationship. Do we not see ourselves in the project itself? I see myself in that work. I'm identified with that work, and there's a, a joy that comes from laboring for God. We're patterned after delight. God saw what he had made. He delighted in it, and he said, it is very good. Could today the lack of dignity in your work be less to do with what you do for a living and more about how you do it and how you could do it in a way that would bring honor and glory and delight not only to God, but to you as you are faithful in the areas he has given some of the businessmen in the room, some of those that work in different areas, some of the stay-at-home moms, the things that you do, uh, draw delight from those as you do those before the Lord in the way that he intended. And yes, I'll concede to you, the curse has made our labor rather tough at times. Work is not always fun. We know that. But he is required and desires of us that work still bring delight in our relationship with God and in our relationship with others. All right, go down to verse 15 in chapter 2. 
And let's spend a moment here as well. A second way in which work helps us as we understand its origins and not allowing culture to define work and what it should be or not be, but allowing the Word of God to do that. Look at verse number 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him, notice this, he put him into the Garden of Eden. Here's now the intention to dress it and to keep it. Number two, allow work as God defines, not only to give you a pattern, but also an assignment. Allow work to give you an assigned origin. We see in Genesis not only God working, but also commissioning others to work on his behalf. I may give you two things as it relates to this assignment from God that we see referenced. Number one, jot this down, assigned to manage. Assigned to manage. We see God assigning man to manage the garden that he had made. He uses the words to dress it and to keep it. Um, One of the things that I have been impressed by lately in my life is God not only started everything, and he's responsible for that. We would say God made the world. God made everything in it, made everyone who is in it. But God also still is working, but he has chosen to work through us. He has assigned us to do things for him and as his representative to others. And so our work uh, is not something we choose arbitrarily. It is assigned to us by God. He gifts us. He calls us. He strengthens us to reach our full potential as we work out his will in our lives. He works through us. And so here would be the thought today. I don't know what you do for a living. If you feel like, hey, man, I've got the job or I've got the career going, or you'd rather, you could take it or leave it, what you have for a job, or maybe you despise what you do, or maybe you're looking for work and you're struggling with uh, your theology and your, your understanding of work. But may I just say today that I believe the dignity of our work comes not from what we do, the task itself, but from whom we've received that re- assignment. Some of you today, the the job that you have is not perfect, and there are a lot of things that concern you about it. But I hope today you sense God gave you that job, that God's working in the midst of that place of employment you have, and He has a purpose for that. Hold your place there in Genesis. Would you go to Colossians for just a moment? Let's bring this into the New Testament setting as we consider the who of our work. Who gave you the job you have? Who's guiding and using you and positioning you uniquely to be a testimony for him in the workplace he has placed you. Colossians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 22. Some of you today, you're retired or you're at a different phase of life. You're a stay-at-home mom with no children at home no longer, and you keep the house, but you're, you're not maybe as actively involved in certain aspects of labor. Uh, there's a place for you as well as you seek and anticipate answering to God for your labor. Colossians 3, look if you will at verse 22. Servants, Paul says, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord as unto the Lord and not unto men. Why would we do that? Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Did you notice that last phrase? The last phrase, there's no respect of persons. We are, we are to answer to God not for what we did, but how we did it. If God gave us an assignment, whatever that was, wherever that was, if we are faithful to that, God will honor and reward. And so our consideration of work needs to be who has assigned it. Just a sidebar. Do you know that God has you in his will today? Are you doing the job he has given you? Are you living out your retirement years in the way God would have you to? Are you doing it his way? Our labor, our work, our stewardship of time and space must be with that in mind. And so even in our fallen world, we're still in God's garden. And one day we'll answer for how we've managed our portion of it. The garden is not as glorious as it was in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, but it's still his garden. And someday what we've done with our little chunk of it uh, will be either a source of joy or a source of regret. All right, go back to Genesis chapter 1 now, and let's look at verse 28. And there's a second aspect of this assignment. Work has been given to us by God. This is not something we've contrived to try to keep the wheels of economy going. And man generated this idea of going to work and going uh, to a job and laboring. This is God's idea. 
Go back to verse 28, and here would be why God gave to man the responsibility and blessing of work. And God blessed them, Genesis chapter 1, look if you would, verse 28, and God said unto them, this is God now speaking, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, notice this next phrase, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Number two, jot this down. Not only are we assigned to manage, number two, we are assigned, assigned to subdue. Assigned to subdue. Um, the other day, uh, my wife and I were working on some projects at the house, and I asked, well, I was holding something, so it's not like I'm always telling my wife to go get me something, make me a sandwich or whatever some of you more whatever men do, but she went and got a drill for me. I was holding something, and she brought it back to me. She's like throttled it a couple of times, wah, wah, you know, and then she handed me the drill. And the other day, that brought back a thought. Someone said, men cannot use a cordless drill without revving it up first. It's just like, I just want to show you, babe. you know, it's same thing with like a, with a car, you know, revving the engine. This is under me. I, I'm over this. Look at the power that I've harnessed. Uh, maybe not with the cordless drill that I own, but with some of the bigger things in life. This idea of subduing, I, I'm on top of this, I'm dominating this, I'm in control of this. Can I just say today the desire that we have for control, the desire we have to subdue, to have dominion, is best expressed in a sanctified way through work. And so the way that we subdue our world is not by talking about it or or, or supposing about it, we do so through our labor. We subdue the field. We, we subdue the resistance at work. We, we overcome the challenges. We problem solve. The work is the way in which we subdue this world. And so the word subdue here indicates that all God has made is good, and the way that we are able to unlock all of its potential is through our labor. Think about this. Much of the world God left unlocked, if you will, but untapped as far as where it could go. Think about all the modern conveniences we enjoy, much of the things that others have worked to develop, technology, tools. Those are ways that man is unlocking, continues to unlock the ever-expanding potential of creation. It's all been embedded there from the beginning of time, but through our work, we're subduing it, we're learning it, we're overcoming it. At times, folks manipulate that, but it, 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 it's our, it's our God-given calling to subdue this world. And what work does is it allows us to tap out the full potential of what God has blessed us with. It's embedded in creation. Work brings it out. And one of the convicting things, takeaways, as I was considering our series and even our study today was, do you ever feel like you're not so much living in dominion? It's like the world's on top of you. I'm, I'm under all of these circumstances. I'm being dominated by all of these things, and some of those we can't control. But where's the dominion? Where's the subduing kind of believer? Maybe it's our apathy. Maybe it's our lack of labor and work that at least contributes to that sensation. God has given you everything you need uh, to live in light of His will, and He's chosen to use your labor to be a part of that process. The other day I was reading a story of um, a young American student who had visited uh, a museum uh, that was uh, ascribing greatness and remembering the, the influence of Beethoven. A young American student became fascinated specifically with a piano that was on display that Beethoven had used to comprise and compose some of his greatest works of all time. She watched for a few minutes, and then she asked the museum guard next to her, standing in front of this display, this piano, if she could play a few bars on it, and she accompanied her request to play it with a rather lavish tip. And so the guard agreed to let her go across the barrier and sit down and play a few bars on the piano. And when she got done, she walked back out, she played a few notes of the Moonlight Sonata and came back across the barrier, and as she was leaving, she said to the guard, Quote, I suppose all the great pianists who have come here want to play on that piano. Guard paused for a minute and began to list some of the famous pianists that had visited the, uh, the display. And he mentioned one specifically. He said uh, that a few years ago he had one of the most world-renowned pianists of that time. And he said he wasn't worthy to even touch the piano. Wasn't even worthy to touch it. Young careless student wanted to take a run at the piano. But the one who revered it didn't feel worthy to touch it. 
Where's our view of work that's not so calloused and so flippant? God worked. We get to work. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, I heard the other day, someone's talking about Friday the 13th. They said, well, Friday the 13th, you know, that's, that's not as bad as Monday, whatever the date is. You know, we dread Mondays. Monday ought to be a day to step into with all of its challenges, with a sense of awe. God, you've given me a body and a mind and a heart and whatever limited way I can do a work for you, help me to see it from that perspective. There ought to be a dignity in our work as we consider its origin. Work was a key part and privilege in paradise. And I would just say, if we were to blame something for the world we live in, there are a lot of sources of the challenges we face. But one of the things we've lost that was in the garden that we need to desperately return to is a healthy value of labor. All right, number two, let's go back to chapter one now in verse 26. And let's look at the second way in which God, through his word, here early on in Genesis, elevates work as something that is dignified if we view it from his perspective. Go back to verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Number two, secondly, God gives to us not only a dignified origin of work, but number two, a dignified profile. A dignified profile. The New Testament was written during, obviously not the Old Testament, but the New Testament was written during the the height of the Greek culture. And the Greeks believed also that the gods, their gods that they worshipped, had made human beings to do work, that that was part of the design. But here's the difference between Greek theology and biblical theology. They saw that as a demeaning thing. Gods are here and mankind is kind of in this servanthood or this this lesser existence, which includes work. To them, work was a demeaning thing. An article I was reading the other day said this, this Greek attitude toward work and its place in human life was largely preserved in both the practice and thought of the Christian church throughout the centuries and still holds a great deal of influence today in our culture. What has come down to us is a set of pervasive ideas. One, that work is a necessary evil. The only good work in this view is the work that helps us make money so we can support our families and pay others to do the menial labor. Second, we believe that lower status or lower paying work is an assault on our dignity. One result of this belief is that many people take jobs they're not suited for at all, choosing to aim for careers that do not fit their gifts but promise higher wages and prestige. Another result is that many people will choose to be unemployed. Have you not seen this? rather than do work that they feel is beneath them. And most service and manual labor falls into this category. Often people who have made it into the knowledge classes show great disdain for the concierge and handymen, dry cleaners, cooks, gardeners, and others who hold service jobs. Do you sense that vibe in our day? I do. If God's called a person to be a gardener or a cook or a repairman or whatever we view as something lesser, is that not as sacred as the knowledge categories? It's all important, and your job is important. If God has handed it to you, then it has with it the ability to have a a distinguished distinguished or dignified profile. All right, let's talk about a couple of things that are spoken about here in Genesis chapter 1. Number one, we need to allow work to give to us a distinguished profile, one of distinguishment. We are different from others, and often our work or our labor is what distinguishes us from others. I'm thankful for what God has gifted and called me to do in the area of labor because it gives me a unique niche. It gives me something to do for him. And the same ought to be true for you. Uh, It is a distinguished profile. How we look when we work in God's work uh, is we have the profile of distinguishment. All right, notice two ways in which God distinguishes man through his work. Number one, jot this down, distinguished from creation. From creation. We see it in verse 26. He says... Let them have dominion, notice over, and they list these, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so the task that God gave to man distinguished him from all other creation. Just this thought today, who else did God give a job to besides man? Do you see him handing out tasks to the fish? Do you see him handing out tasks to the cattle? He tells them to replenish the earth or to uh, to, to be fruitful and to multiply, but he does not give to them a job. And so it is our office, it is our job description 
that distinguishes us from mankind. While animals and plants are commanded to reproduce, only human beings are given a job. Instead of viewing the job as beneath us or demeaning of us, it is, I think, a source of great distinguishment that God gives to people a task, a place of work and labor. And so see that job, see that labor, see that home that you're responsible for uh, through the lens of distinguishment. While many see ordinary work, especially manual labor, as relegating human beings to an animal level, the Bible sees all work as distinguishing human beings from animals. There's no job if God put, gives you the job that's beneath you or is dehumanizing. The most humanizing thing we can do is work, to do the job that God has entrusted to us. So no matter what you do for a living, don't allow it to debase you or to inflate you with pride. The most deifying activity you can be involved in uh, is to be involved uh, in work. All right, then notice if we will in verse 26, he says, let us make man our image after our likeness. He distinguishes them from all of those animals listed. Notice, and let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. Number two, work not only allows us to be distinguished from creation, number two, allows us to be distinguished over creation. Distinguished over creation. Um, I don't know if you're a coffee person or not. The place I mentioned that I went crazy on Friday and drank a soft drink with a straw had a, uh, had a sign behind us, and it had a picture of a coffee mug, and it had this caption. It said, I own you. I own you. And we were all laughing. I'm thinking, yes, I guess I, I, I feel convicted by that sign. I'm a bit of a coffee drinker, but I don't drink at this place. I'm about to show you, just for the record. Do you hear about this story? We're a month removed from the largest Starbucks in the world being opened in uh, Chicago. It's called Starbucks Reserve. Uh, it opens in November. Some of you have already changed your plans now, you bunch of liberals out there. Uh, and uh, it's scheduled to open on November the 15th at 10 a.m. Why not earlier? I don't know for us coffee drinkers. But it's to immerse people in what coffee lovers uh, dream about talking about. It's dedicated to roasting and brewing all kinds of coffee from all over the world. It's four stories, 43,000 square feet, uh, and it'll be on the city's magnificent mile at the intersection of Michigan and Erie Street. And they said it's only the fourth of its kind. It's the largest. The other three are in Milan, Shanghai, and Tokyo. I mean, this is like the premier place to drink coffee. I don't know how much they're going to charge you, you know, 50 bucks a cup or whatever it'll be. But it, can you imagine working there? I work at the world's largest Starbucks in the world. I mean, it's gold-plated, and there's all kinds. They were showing some of the interior finishes and just a high-profile place to work. Sometimes if we're not careful, we allow what's associated with our work to be the source of our dignity, to be the source of our distinguishment, instead of it being the assignment that God has given, and specifically this idea of let them have dominion. Now, if you go back to the text here in verse 26, he has this idea of to rule over, this ruling idea. We are made in his image. Did you notice that at the beginning of verse 26? Let us make man in our image. And because they're in our image, let them exert their dominion over uh, the rest of creation, not in a domineering kind of way, but in a stewardship kind of way. We are the vice regents. We are co, if you will, authorities with God over his creation. And what we basically do, here's the feel of that idea of dominion, is we take what is chaotic and we bring structure. We take what are raw elements or materials and we build something with them that brings honor and glory to the Lord. Um, I've shared this, I think, not this specific story maybe, but one of the things I love to do when I travel, I don't travel a lot, is I love to go through places, random places where someone's working a job that no one knows about. It's, a, it's a, what we call maybe just an entry-level job, maybe a college student, high school student, or somebody has worked that job for a number of years, but they're doing it with all the passion in their being. I love to meet people like that, drive through gas station, wherever. And I remember years ago, we went into, any of you ever eaten at a White Castle? I think I've been to one. This is the only time I think I ever ate at White Castle. Some of you may enjoy them. Uh, we don't have them close by here. But uh, we were coming back from a ball trip. I was in high school. And we went to a White Castle, middle of the night. It was like, you know, they're open all night, right, I think. Uh, it was late at night, and we ordered like 
150, you know, those sliders, those little hamburgers that are so healthy and, you know, they'd be on the same level as the Starbucks I just showed you. That kind of, I'm just kidding. But anyway, so we, and the guy that, and they have a microphone, at least the ones that I've been in, and they announce your order. And this guy, I can't remember his name, he has badge on his, on his left uh, chest there, and he just started calling out orders, and he always would say for the last, at the time you could get cinnamon rolls, which I'm sure were equally healthy to the sliders, and he would always end with, he'd say, I got, you know, Tom's order, and here's what, it, he'd list the things, and they'd say, and a cinnamon roll. He'd always end with, and a cinnamon roll. He would just roll that in at the end, and I, we would just wait for him to say that, you know, and then cheer, you know, as high school students. He just had passion. Where's the passion in the work God's called us to? And if you're not in a place you can have that passion, maybe something needs to be reconsidered. God wants us to be his representatives. And we are distinguished over creation. I get to work in this job. I get to work for God in this area. And here would be the thought. Do you view your job as actively participating with God to do something in that area of employment? You're you're a, a partner with him. You're working on his behalf. Not dominion for your own agenda, but your dominion for his glory and honor. And could the lack of feeling dominion in your life be less about changing your job and more about changing your attitude, changing your view of where God has you and viewing it through the lens of God's word? All right, secondly, go to verse 26 again. And if you will notice, he says this at the beginning of verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Make man in our image. Number two, allow work to give you a sacred profile. Allow work to give to you not only a distinguished profile. Man, look at that guy doing his work. He's distinguished. But more importantly, that it gives to you a sacred profile, one of eternal significance. I don't know about you, but when I look at the work that I do, even in ministry, um, I I do that primarily as a job. Uh, Someone was saying today, hey, you came out of your cocoon, your office. I have no windows in my office. And I was saying, uh, pastors tend to be viewed as extroverts. You know, we just love being around people. Actually, pastors primarily are introverts because if we weren't, we'd lose our minds. You know, we're by ourselves a lot, studying the word and praying. And, uh, and you know, extroverts are those that get energy when they're around people. Introverts get energy when they're not around people, when they're by themselves. And I would be maybe lean toward that second a bit. But the other day I was thinking about this concept of, of, of just uh, being with God and being what I should be with God. And in, even in what I do for a living, if we're not careful, we view work as only what's happening physically. I did that, and that led to this, and we're focused on site-based priorities and evaluations. What about the spiritual? Could you today, if I were to ask you, let's pause for a minute, and I point to you and say, tell me what God is doing through your employer, your employment, what God's doing through your work, what God's doing through your day-to-day schedule. Do you have things to list? God's using this to accomplish this, or at least I'm trusting him. He's going to use it for this. There needs to be those connections made, and if they're not, uh, that's unsustainable. Allow work to give to you a sacred profile. A few months ago, I was on the road, and I was listening to several podcasts, and I was listening to an interview between one of the founders. I can't pronounce his name because he's not from the U.S. One of the founders of the Ritz-Carlton uh, Hotel Company. And I've heard this reference before, but he quoted it and referenced it in an interview. And he said they built their company, the Ritz-Carlton, which is not your Motel 8 option, if you follow my drift on that, if you've ever been in one or driven by one. But he said the motto of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company is this. Here it is. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That's a powerful statement because in the hotel industry, often those at the front desk or those cleaning the rooms or those doing whatever are seen as lesser. The bellhop, the guy manning the elevator, the guy manning the door. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That ought to be the spirit of our labor. Uh, There's a dignity there not because of me and what I'm doing, but the God who assigned it to me. And if it's at the door, uh, if it's on the elevator, if it's something more from some people's perspective, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That needs to be the motto uh, and the feel of our ministry for the Lord. How do we get that? Because I don't know about you, some of the things you're going to do this week don't feel real godlike and real dignified and real sacred when you do them. I may give you two things found here quickly in the text. Number one, sacred in representation. Sacred, our work is sacred in its representation. We are in his image. We are after his likeness, and we are no 
we are never more like God than when we are working. Work has a dignity because it's something that God does. Because we do it in his place, we are his representatives. He's not still doing what we see later in the text. Man is doing that as his representative. And so work has dignity because it's something God does and something that we do uh, in his place. Someone said this, if God came into the world, what would he be like? If God came into the world, what would he be like? For the ancient Greeks, he might have been a philosopher king. The ancient Romans might have looked for a just and noble statesman. But how does the God of the Hebrews come into the world as a what? A carpenter. God came in with that kind of a profile. And you think you got a better profile? You want to get going? You want to maintain? There's a dignity. There's a God-likeness when we labor in the area that God has given. In Genesis, we see God as a gardener. In the New Testament, we see him as a carpenter. No task is too small. Uh, that we cannot from it derive a sense of dignity. It's work given by God. Simple physical labor is God's work, as much as studying and teaching the deep theological truths of his word. Everything matters when it's for God. All right, and then notice, if you will, verse 26, again, he says, let us make, make man in our image. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Go, if you will, to chapter 2 for just a moment in verse 7, and we see the the nuts and bolts of how God made man. Verse 7 of Genesis 2, And the Lord God formed man, formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's what happened just prior to being assigned to the garden as a tender of that garden. Let us make man. Secondly, jot this down, not only is our work sacred in that it is a representation, number two, sacred intangibility. Sacred intangibility. The beauty of work is that it allows us to tangibly serve God. Um, You and I could say, I want to please God, I want to do something for God, and I will assure you to do that properly will always involve labor, it will always involve work. It gives us a means to tangibly show God, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to make a difference for you. What a beautiful gift from God. Sacred in that it is tangible. Um, Speaking of my office, I was in there working on some of what we're studying today. And a couple of our ladies walked by, Miss Becca, who cleans some in our building, and Miss Lori, who cleans in our nursery. And uh, I was writing this sermon or working on this, right? And they both said, hi, pastor, and then went to do their thing cleaning. Some of you have not thought about the things that happen every week in this building that make what we do possible. Um, Brother Dan mows our grass every week, but keeps it, or maybe not right now, he's mowing it every week, but it keeps that down. Can you imagine if those things were not done? Maybe in a week we wouldn't notice, two weeks. But I don't want to be melodramatic, but if our ladies specifically did not, Dan doesn't matter as much, but the ladies will we'll park on that. You can't offend the ladies, guys, you know, whatever. But ladies, if they didn't clean, would that not ultimately have some detrimental consequences in our church? I mean, let's talk about mold, let's talk about bacteria, let's talk about things that ultimately will kill us, all right? So now, there we go. That's maybe a bit melodramatic there. But those things matter, don't they? Wiping a surface one week, not a big deal. But the, the, the critical mass, when that reaches critical mass, everything we do is important. Our work matters, it impacts lives, it changes ultimately eternal destinies as we are faithful or unfaithful to the work that God has given And so, quote, menial work is still work that matters. It matters because it impacts others. And so there's a dignity to our work uh, in that it gives us a way to be tangible in our faithfulness to the Lord. All work has dignity because it reflects God's image in us. And also because the material creation we are called to care for still possesses remnants of God's goodness. Did you notice that? We read that in verse 31 a moment ago. He looked at it and said it was very good that has morality connected to it. And so our stewardship of this good creation, uh, it matters uh, before the Lord. Um, I was reading something the other day. The author was talking about how we view the material world versus other religions. Now, just for those of you maybe that think a bit more on this, this will give you something to chew on. The author said this, according to the Bible, this world is the forerunner of the new heavens and new earth which will be purified, restored, and enhanced at the renewal of all things. 
And he said this, No other religion envisions matter and spirit living together in integrity forever. And so birds flying and oceans roaring and people eating and walking and loving are permanently good things. They're good things. And so how we manage them right now matters. It is of eternal significance. The believer cannot look down on labor because it involves the material world. Maybe your job is more what we would consider hands-on or blue-collar. That job is significant. Listen, you touch more stuff and don't talk as much as some of the white-collar folks maybe in the room. You're touching stuff God made. Nothing's neutral. Nothing's, nothing's static. Nothing is, is, is in between good or bad. It, it all matters. And so how we manage that matters to the Lord. Be faithful to view it from that perspective. All right, let's end today by going to John chapter 5. Would you go there for a few moments as we kind of begin to bring this to application today? John chapter 5, Christ speaks of work several times in his teachings. But this verse specifically, this text is profound in what it indicates of our God. John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse number 17. John chapter 5 and verse 17. John chapter 5 and verse 17. And as you're turning there, um, there was an interesting story in the news about a week and a half ago uh, about a lady in uh, Czechoslovakia, a Czech woman. Uh, The article said, When a helicopter rushed an unconscious Czech woman who had suffered a severe stroke to the hospital in April, her chances of survival were slim. And those of the baby she had carried in her womb for 15 weeks, little better. And yet on August 15th, against all odds, a healthy baby girl was born by cesarean section, weighing 4.7 pounds and measuring 16.5 inches. To her, notice this, brain-dead mother, setting a new record in the process. It said the 117 days that she had been kept alive in the womb, a process fraught with all kinds of potential complications, were believed to be a record for the longest artificially sustained pregnancy in a brain-dead mother. And so you know, all hope was lost, and yet they tried and look at uh, what happened. And the article was talking about the logistics of that, and most of you that have medical background would be able to weigh in on more specifics. But they said they put the 27-year-old woman on artificial life support to keep the pregnancy going, and even regularly moved her legs to simulate walking to help the child's growth. I found that interesting. After delivering the 34th week of gestation with the husband and other family members present, medical staff disconnected the mother's life support systems and allowed her to die. Now, here's the thought before we go to John 5. I think many times the reason our work doesn't matter, listen to me, is because we don't see who counts on it. Who, not what, who counts on it. Your work affects your relationship with God or lack thereof. Your work affects everyone you know, everyone you impact. Some of you today, we're still benefiting and blessed by the work of the years that you've invested now in your retirement years and the ways that you give and sacrifice and invest. Our work affects others. And so the dignity of work is not found in the task or the title. It's seen in how it impacts our relationships and our responsibilities toward God and then toward others. Now, with that in mind, look here in John chapter 5. And let's begin back in verse 10 just for sake of context because we're dealing with the rest day. The Sabbath also weaves into this. And the Jews said unto him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for you to carry thy bed. You can't work today. And he answered them, he said, he, uh, he answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. All right, so this is the man that Christ is healed. Then they asked him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? Notice he says, what man? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art uh, art made whole, sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. And the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now notice verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh here too, and I work. My Father worketh here too, and I work. 
God rested on the seventh day, did he not? But can I just remind you, God has been working ever since. God's still working. Who's building the mansion? Who's building the room in the Father's house for you and I today? It's God. He's working. He's, he's enlisting others to enter into his labor. God is working. And Jesus said, just as God has continued to do what he does, he sustains the universe. The universe isn't just happening. God's working. Life your lungs, everything happening and working is because he first is working. And Jesus said in response to that, I too work. And my question to you today is this. Jesus said that my father worketh here too. Can you say also, and I work and I work. The eagerness of that, the dignity of that, the sacredness of that. And if God is not too good to work, and if Jesus Christ, who also is God, is not too good to work, then neither are you and neither am I. And so to be like Christ means we abandon these man-made rules of the Sabbath and instead we see dignity in work and we enlist in it with all of our being. All right, let me show you this quote and we'll be done today. Here it is. I love this statement. What is the Christian understanding of work? One author said, it is that work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. That includes all of us then. We're still alive. We have a place to work. It is or should be the full expression of the worker's faculties. And then I love this part of the statement. The medium in which he offers himself to God. Is that your Monday morning? Is that your Friday afternoon? Is that your mindset if you work the weekends? That, you're offering, that your job is a means to offer yourself fully to God? Or do you view it the way the world views it? Got to keep, keep the boss happy. Got to pay the bills. Got to go through the motions. My prayer for you is that work will become something more dignified with the Lord's help. Here's the question and we're done. Will you allow God to dignify your work with his biblically revealed origin? Work is God's idea. Will you see it as a good thing, a blessed thing? And number two, will you allow him to restore and dignify your work with a biblically revealed profile? Wouldn't it be neat if tomorrow when you go to work or this week, whatever you do, no matter how others view it, that, that you have a sense that this is significant? They'll change the conversations you have. They'll change how you process the stresses and the challenges in the workplace you're at. See it the way God sees it. Let him give you dignity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today.